<clears throat> and we have now chapter four. Shasta falls in with the Narnians. At first, Shasta could see nothing in the valley below him but a sea of mist with a few domes and pinnacles rising from it. But as the light increased and the mist cleared away, he saw more and more. A broad river divided itself into two streams, and on the island between them stood the city of Tashban, one of the wonders of the world. Round the very edge of the island, so that the water lapped against the stone, ran high walls, strengthened with so many towers that he soon gave up trying to count them. Inside the walls, the island rose in a hill, and every bit of that hill, up to the Tisrock's palace and the great temple of Tash at the top, was completely covered with buildings. Terrace upon terrace, street above street, zigzag roads or huge flights of steps bordered with orange trees and lemon trees, roof gardens, balconies, deep archways, pillared colonnades, spires, battlements, minarets, pinnacles. And when at last the sun rose out of the sea and the great silver-plated dome of the temple flashed back its light, he was almost dazzled. Get on, Shasta, Bree kept saying. The river banks on each side of the valley were such a mass of gardens that they looked at first like a forest, until you got closer and saw the white walls of innumerable houses peeping out from beneath the trees. Soon after that, Shasta noticed a delicious smell of flowers and fruit. About 15 minutes later, they were down among them, plodding on a level road with white walls on each side and trees bending over them, over the walls. I say, said Shasta in an awed voice, this is a wonderful place. I dare say, said Bree, but I wish we were safely through it and out on the other side, Narnia and the north. At that moment, a low, throbbing noise began, which gradually swelled louder and louder till the whole valley seemed to be swaying with it. It was a musical noise, but so strong and solemn as to be a little frightening. That's the horns blowing for the city gates to be open, said Bree. We shall be there in a minute. Now, Arvis, do drop your shoulders a bit and step heavier and try to look less like a princess. Try to imagine you've been kicked and cuffed and called names all your life. If it comes to that, said Arvis, what about you drooping your head a bit more and arching your neck a little bit less and trying to look less like a war horse? Hush, said Bree. Here we are. And they were. They had come to the river's edge and the road ahead of them ran along a many arched bridge. The water danced brightly in the early sunlight. The way to their right, nearer the mouth's, river's mouth, they caught a glimpse of ship's masts. Several other travellers were before them on the bridge, mostly peasants driving laden donkeys and mules or carrying baskets on their heads. The children and horses joined the crowd. Is anything wrong? whispered Shasta to Aravis, who had an odd look on her face. Oh, it's all very well for you, whispered Aravis rather savagely. What would you care about Tashban? But I ought to be riding in on a litter with soldiers before me and slaves behind, and perhaps going to a feast in the Tisrock's palace, may he live forever, not sneaking in like this. It's different for you. Shasta thought all this very silly. At the far end of the bridge, the walls of the city towered high above them, and the brazen gates stood open in the gateway, which was really wide, but looked narrow because it was so very high. Half a dozen soldiers, leaning on their spears, stood on each end. Aravis couldn't help thinking, they'd all jump to attention and salute me if they knew whose daughter I am. But the others were only thinking of how they'd get through and hoping the soldiers would not ask any questions. Fortunately, they did not. But one of them picked a carrot out of a peasant's basket and threw it at Shasta with a rough laugh, saying, Hey, horse boy, you'll catch it if your master finds you've been using his saddle horse for pack work. This frightened him badly, for of course it showed that no one who knew anything about horses would mistake Bree for anything but a charger. It's my master's orders, so there, said Shasta, but it would have been better if he had held his tongue, for the soldier gave him a box on the side of his face that nearly knocked him down and said, Take that, you young filth, to teach you how to talk to free men. But they all slunk into the city without being stopped. Shasta cried only a very little. He was used to hard knocks. Inside the gates, Tashban did not at first seem so splendid as it had looked from a distance. 
The first street was narrow, and there, was hard, and there were hardly any windows in the walls on each side. It was much more crowded than Shasta had expected, crowded partly by the peasants on their way to market, who had come in with them, but also with water sellers, sweetmeat sellers, porters, soldiers, beggars, ragged children, hens, stray dogs, and barefooted slaves. What you would chiefly have noticed if you had been there were the smells, which came from unwashed people, unwashed dogs, scent, garlic, onions, and the piles of refuse which lay everywhere. Shasta was pretending to lead, but it was really Bree who knew the way and kept guiding him by little nudges with his nose. They soon turned to the left and began going up a steep hill. It was much fresher and pleasanter, for the road was bordered by trees and there were houses only on the right side. On the other, they looked out over the roofs of houses in the lower town and could see some way up the river. Then they went round a hairpin bend to their right and continued rising. They were zigzagging up to the centre of Tashban. Soon they came to finer streets, great statues of the gods and heroes of colour men who are mostly impressive rather than agreeable to look at, rows on shining pedestals. Palm trees and pillared arcades cast shadows over the burning pavements and through the arched gateways of many a palace Shasta caught sight of green branches, cool fountains and smooth lawns. It must be nice inside, he thought. At every turn Shasta hoped they were getting out of the crowd, but they never did. This made their progress very slow, and every now and then they had to stop altogether. This usually happened because a loud voice shouted out, Way, way, way for the Tarkhan, or for the Tarkina, or for the 15th Vizier, or for the Ambassador. And everywhere in the crowd would crush back against the walls, and above their heads Shasta would sometimes see the great lord or lady for whom all the fuss was being made, lolling upon a litter which four or even six gigantic slaves carried on their bare shoulders. For in Tashban there is only one traffic regulation, which is that everyone who is less important has to get out of the way for everyone who is more important, unless you want a cut from a whip or a punch from the butt end of a spear. It was in a splendid street, very near the top of the city, the Tisrock's palace was the only thing above it, that the most disastrous of these stoppages occurred. Way, 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 came the voice, way for the white barbarian king. The guest of the Tisrock, may he live forever. Way for the Narnian lords. Shasta tried to get out of the way and to make Bree go back, but no horse, not even a talking horse from Narnia, backs easily. And a woman with a very edgy basket in her hands, who was just behind Shasta, pushed the basket hard against his shoulders and said, Now then, who are you shoving? And then someone else jostled him from the other side, and in the confusion of the moment he lost hold of Bree. And then the whole crowd behind him became so stiffened and packed tight that he couldn't move at all. So he found himself unintentionally in the first row and had a fine sight of the party that was coming down the street. It was quite unlike any other party they had seen that day. The crier who went before it shouting, way, way, was the only calamine in it. And there was no litter, everyone was on foot. There were about half a dozen men and Shasta had never seen anyone like them before. For one thing, they were all as fair skinned as himself and most of them had fair hair, and they were not dressed like the men of Calamen. Most of them had legs bare to the knee. Their tunics were of fine, bright, hardy colours, woodland green, or gay yellow, or fresh blue. Instead of turbans, they wore steel or silver caps, some of them, some of them set with jewels, and one with little wings on each side of it. A few were bareheaded. The swords at their side were long and straight, not curved like Calamene scimitars, and instead of being grave and mysterious like most Calamines, they walked with a swing and let their arms and shoulders go free and chatted and laughed. One was whistling. You could see that they were ready to be friends with anyone who was friendly and didn't give a fig for anyone who wasn't. Shasta thought he had never seen anything so lovely in his life. But there was no time to enjoy it, for at once a really dreadful thing happened. The leader of the fair-haired men suddenly pointed at Shasta, cried out, There he is! There's our runaway! and seized him by the shoulder. Next moment he gave Shasta a smack, not a cruel one you make to cry, but a sharp one to let you know you were in disgrace, and added, shaking, Shame on you, my lord! Fie for shame! Queen Susan's eyes are red with weeping because of you. What? Truant for a whole night! Where have you been? Shasta would have darted under Bree's body and tried to make himself scarce in the crowd if he had had the least chance, but the fair-haired men were all round him by now, and he was held firm. Of course, his first impulse was to say, 
that he was only poor Arshish, the fisherman's son, and that the foreign lord must have mistaken him for someone else. But then the very last thing he wanted to do in that crowded place was to start explaining who he was and what he was doing. If he started on that, he would soon be asked where he had got his horse from and who Arvis was, and then goodbye to any chance of getting through Tashban. His next impulse was to look at Bree for help, but Bree had no intention of letting all the crowd know that he could talk and stood looking just as stupid as a horse can. As for Arvis, Shasta did not even dare look at her for fear of drawing attention, and there was no time to think, for the leader of the Narnians said at once, Take one of his little lordship's hands, Peridon, of your courtesy, and I'll take the other. And now on. Our royal sister's mind will be greatly eased when she sees our young scapegrace safe in our lodging. And so, before they were halfway through Tashban, all their plans were ruined. And without even a chance to say goodbye to the others, Shasta found himself being marched off among strangers and quite unable to guess what might be going to happen next. The Narnian king, for Shasta began to see by the way the rest spoke to him that he must be a king, kept on asking him questions, where he had been, how he had got out, what he had done with his clothes, and didn't he know that he had been very naughty? Only the king called it naught instead of naughty. And Shasta said nothing in return because he couldn't think of anything to say that would not be dangerous. What? All mum? asked the king. I must, plain you tell, I must plainly tell you, prince, that this hangdog silence becomes one of your blood even less than the scape itself. To run away might pass for a boy's frolic with some spirit in it, but the king's son of Archenland should, vouch his, should avouch his deed, not hang his head like a Calamine slave. This was very unpleasant. For Shasta felt all the time that, his young, that this young king was the very nicest kind of grown-up and would have liked to make a good impression on him. The strangers led him, held tightly by both hands, along a narrow street, and down a flight of shallow stairs, and then up another to a wide doorway and a white wall with two tall, dark cypress trees, one on each side of it. Once through the arch, Shasta found himself in a courtyard, which was also a garden. A marble basin of clean water in the centre was kept continually rippling by the fountain that fell into it. Orange trees grew round it out of smooth grass, and the four white walls which surrounded the lawn were covered with climbing roses. The noise and dust and crowding of the streets seemed suddenly far away. He was led rapidly across the garden and then into a dark doorway. The crier remained outside. After that, they took him along a corridor where the stone floor felt beautifully cool to his hot feet and up some stairs. A moment later, he found himself blinking in the light of a big, airy room with wide open windows, all looking north so that no sun came in. There was a carpet on the floor, more wonderfully coloured than anything he had ever seen, and his feet sank down into it as if he were treading in thick moss. All round the walls, there were low sofas with rich cushions on them, and the room seemed to be full of people. Very queer people, some of them, thought Shasta, but he had no time to think of that before the most beautiful lady he had ever seen rose from her place and threw her arms round him and kissed him, saying, Oh, Corin, Corin, how could you? And thou and I such close friends ever since thy mother died. And what should I have said to thy royal father if I came home without thee? Would have been a cause almost of war between Archenland and Narnia, which are friends time out of mind. It was not, playmate, very naught of thee to use us so. Apparently, thought Shasta to himself, I'm being mistaken for a prince of Archenland, wherever that is, and these must be the Narnians. I wonder where the real Corin is. But these thoughts did not help him say anything out loud. Where hast thou been, Corin? Said, said the lady, her hands still on Shasta's shoulders. I, I don't know, stammered Shasta. There it is, Susan, said the king. I could get no tale out of him, true or false. Your Majesties, Queen Susan, King Edmund, said a voice. And when Shasta turned to look at the speaker, he nearly jumped out of his skin with surprise. For this was one of these queer people whom he had noticed out of the corner of his eye when he first came into the room. He was about the same height as Shasta himself. From the waist upwards, he was like a man, but his legs were hairy like goats and shaped like a goat's, and he had goat's hooves and a tail. His skin was rather red and he had curly hair and a short pointed beard and two little horns. horns. He was, in fact, a fawn, which is a creature Shasta had never seen a picture of or even heard of. And if you've read a book called The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, you may like to know that this was the very same fawn 
Tomnus by name, whom Queen Susan's sister Lucy had met on the very first day when she found her way into Narnia. But he was a good deal older now, for by this time Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy had been kings and queens of Narnia for several years. Your Majesties, he was saying, his little highness has had a touch of the sun. Look at him, he is dazed. He does not know where he is. Then, of course, everyone stopped scolding Shasta and asked him questions, and he was made m and asking him questions, and he was made much of, and laid on a sofa, and cushions were put under his head, and he was given iced sherbet in a golden cup to drink, and told to keep very quiet. Nothing like this had ever happened to Shasta in his life before. He had never even imagined lying on anything so comfortable as that sofa, or drinking anything so delicious as that sherbet. He was still wondering what had happened to the others and how on earth he was going to escape and meet them at the tombs and what would happen when the real Corin turned up again. But none of these worries se seemed so pressing now that he was so comfortable and perhaps later on there would be nice things to eat. Meanwhile, the people in that cool, airy room were very interesting. Besides the fawn, there were two dwarfs, a kind of creature he had never seen before, and a very large raven. The rest were all humans grown-ups, but young, and all of them, both men and women, had nicer faces and voices than most Calamines, and soon Shasta found himself taking an interest in the conversation. Now, madam, the king was saying to Queen Susan, the lady who had kissed Shasta, what thinks you? We have been in this city fully three weeks. Have you yet settled in your mind whether you will marry this dark-faced lover of yours, this Prince Rabadash, or no? The lady shook her head. No, brother, she said, not for all the jewels in Tashban. Hello, thought Shasta, although they're king and queen, they're brother and sister, not married to one another. Truly, sister, said the king, I should have loved you the less if you had taken them. And I tell you that at the first coming of the Tisroc's ambassadors into Narnia to treat of this marriage, and later when the prince was our guest at Ker Parabel, it was a wonder to me that ever you could find it in your heart to show him so much favour. <sighs> that was my folly, Edmund, said Queen Susan, of which I cry you mercy. Yet when he was with us in Narnia, truly this prince bore himself in another fashion than he does now in Tashban. For I take you to all to witness what marvellous feats he did in that great tournament and Hastelud, which our brother, the king, high king, made for him. And how meekly and courteously he consorted with us the space of seven days. But here in his own city, he has shown another face. Ah, croaked the raven. It is an old saying, see the bear in his own den before you judge of his conditions. That's very true, Salopod, Salopad, said one of the dwarves, and another is, come live with me, and you'll know me. Yes, said the king, we have now seen him for what he is, that is, a most proud, bloody, luxurious, cruel, and self-pleasing tyrant. Then, in the name of Aslan, said Susan, let us leave Tashban this very day. There's the rub, sister, said Edmund, for now I must open to you all that has been growing in my mind these last two days and more. Peridon, of your courtesy, look to the door and see that there is no spy upon us. All well? So, for now we must be secret. Everyone had begun to look very serious. Queen Susan jumped up and ran to her brother. Oh, Edmund, she cried, what is it? There is something dreadful in your face. So ends chapter four. Here we are, some of the characters we know have shown up again. One of the best guys, Caesar.